to the Recovate's new video series, kind of follow up to our podcast, podcast 2.0 you might call it, um, now on glorious video rather than just audio, although we'll probably have the audio version available as well if you want that. Anyway, today we're talking to Chris Cook, director of One for the Road, which is a 2003 movie based around alcohol, male insecurities, male bonding, all sorts of interesting stuff, great cast, great movie, lots of interesting ideas behind it, and also great production innovations involved in this movie that were very much ahead of their time, or perhaps even of their time, and represent what was possible with movies at that point, how things were being democratised. But we'll talk about all that with Chris very shortly. Um, For now... I just say we'll be doing this kind of thing, hopefully, on a pretty regular basis. Um, interviews with various people. We'll also be talking soon after this with the, the guys from Indicator um, about this movie specifically, but also just the general idea of doing special editions of cult movies, for want of a better description. I'm sure. Most of you are probably familiar with what Indicator do, so I don't really need to explain that. But we'll be going into, hopefully going into some depth and finding out what's involved and the ins and outs. And also the difficulties involved in resurrecting very old films. Um, Films usually quite a lot older than this one, it's got to be said. So hopefully you'll stick around with us for that and for other projects that we'll be reviewing films, talking to filmmakers, film distributors generally just discussing whatever comes to mind hopefully we'll build up a nice little catalogue of video content for you to enjoy or be a poll by you know whatever your taste is so if you like this kind of thing and you want to see more then feel free to check out our patreon feel free to check out our buy me a coffee page we'll have the links below every penny helps to keep us able to carry on doing this sort of thing And also you'll get exclusives, additional video content. There'll be more of this one, for instance, more of Chris talking about um, other stuff outside of uh, One for the Road. So by all means, join us, support us. Check out the Reprobate website, of course, for essentially daily updates of articles, deep dives, film reviews, music reviews, food and drink reviews, everything reviews. Um, Lots of... The pointed opinion, commentary, the whole shebang, it's all there. Let's so. move on and talk to Chris Cook. So, yeah, so Chris, you made One for the Road in 2003, and I guess the project was, was kind of bubbling away for quite a while before that. So how did it all begin? Well, 2003, it's kind of nearly a 20th anniversary, isn't it? It's nearly a 20th anniversary re-release of the film. but um. In fact, kind of working backwards, I'd started writing about the film or writing the kind of concept of the film around sort of 2001, um, because Film 4 had asked if we wanted to develop a feature. Um, and I, I didn't know, I, I, I'm pretty ignorant, but I didn't know that I could base it on the short that I'd just made, a short called Shifting Units. The Shifting Units is really, really the point though, where One for the Road <laughs> kind of originates from. Yeah. So we'd made this short film, Shifting Units, in about 1999-2000. And it was about this character, Paul, this kind of really hyper-driven alcoholic salesman. He's supposed to shift a certain number of units by the end of the week or else he'll lose his job. But he's shifting all the units he can, alcohol units, down the pub. Kind of that's obvious kind of uh, relationship between those two things. And... Um, it turned out to be a real success. We'd shot it on DV cam and we'd uh, made it kind of as loosely as we could, you know what I mean? Like we wouldn't storyboard, we would just do a few shot lists or have an idea of what was needed to be to be kind of covered uh, to get those scenes so that everything looked kind of immediate and everything. And it had been a success at the Edinburgh Film Festival, uh, which is when Film 4 came back in and funded the short and said, um, hey, do you want to do a feature? And I spent... <laughs> I spent two long summers sat on my own typing out rough ideas but that we were avoiding that short film until I thought, 
oh, you mean I could just base, uh, you know, I could have that character back and I can add some more characters. Do you know what I mean? And make this kind of ensemble story about, you know, these kind of um, characters here, misbegotten kind of characters who, who meet up by chance uh, by the fact that they all have to attend a kind of an alcohol awareness course because um, the court has ordered it. Mm. So it's it, it then went into kind of me spending another long summer of typing out a script, you know what I mean? Like trying to, like it's it's kind of one thing to kind of say you're going to do something that's slightly informal and is improvisational and is kind of quite loose. But how do you fund that and how do you prove that? Well, we've got the short on one hand and the, the other thing was to kind of really get to grips with the script. You know what I mean? The funders really wanted us to kind of know what that story was. They wanted to know what it was they were funding. So if we were going to have this kind of loose style, um, we had to plan it. We had to plan our loose style. Yeah, well, it's, it's that, that's, that's, that's that kind of weird thing, though, isn't it? That you know, you as soon as you tell people that X amount of something is is improvised, then the assumption is, I think, from a lot of people, oh, you must have just, you know, the entire thing is just made up as you go along. You all just turned up with a few cameras one day, and, and if you make sense, like, well, all right, let's make this film. Well, we've got new... not like that at all, is it? No, we've gotten kind of used to this idea um, about, you know, just kind of culturally in Nottingham. I think cheers, really. Michael. Oh, cheers. Just culturally in Nottingham, we were all kind of working uh, on each other's projects. We were all sort of unemployed or between jobs or starting to work uh, in various kind of capacities uh, in Nottingham. And... Um, it meant that we had time, you know what I mean, to sort of practice, to kind of, we were on a course, uh, a bunch of us called uh, Head Start, yeah, um, that kind yeah. of taught you the basics of filmmaking and then gave you the kind of opportunity to develop those skills. Um, so we were kind of working together and, and quite fast and quite loose to kind of make all kinds of short films, all kinds of genres and everything. Um, so we, we were used to kind of being able to, to, to figure what the director wanted quite quickly. You know what I mean? Like we're forming little production teams left, right and center to make stuff. And I think with me, um, I'd gotten like a, a group of filmmakers around uh, who all went on to direct or were already directing, but they would be really great collaborators because they knew kind of what I wanted. So there was, there was less fuss about storyboards and shot lists. Um, and a greater sense of, of what the rules might be. You know, I mean, Steve Shield tells an anecdote about how, um, you know, he had to follow Rupert's character through this really elaborately through the kitchens of this hotel up into the bar, up, up to the bar where, where he'd improvise a scene with the barman. Then he came back and said, it was okay, but I banged into a table <laughs> midway through and I thought, that's the one. <laughs> so yeah, okay, because I wasn't there to see it because I wouldn't have been able to, you know, to I'd be I'd be in the way. So there was a lot of trust, a lot of collaboration, and a lot of um, of loose visual style. Um, but we needed to kind of have structure and everything. And you know, I mean, when when working with a budget, it was very different. And not just because those people kind of uh, have to trust you, but because they're also they're investing a lot of money in the project. You know what I mean? They're saying, okay, we like the style of what you did. And you'll still have to prove yourself with a script so that we know what, what the story is and then how people are going to work um, with either scripted dialogue or improvisational dialogue needs to be factored into the production schedule, into pre-production. Um, so we started workshopping and then those workshops would then go back into the script as well. Whenever something was fresh or whenever something felt like it was adding to the character, we could build it in. So really it meant that everybody, by the time we started rolling, had uh, an idea of what the story was, they knew the characters, and they knew, they knew their dialogue. And then they could build a little bit. They could ad lib, they could take the edge off the kind of, off the writing. Do you know yeah. what I mean? There was, one of the phrases that came out quite often because of the style of, of filmmaking was that it's only words. So if people wanted to change it a little bit, you know what I mean? They didn't have to, even though I'd labored over that script and cried my eyes out trying to write the thing, and worn my fingers down to stumps. I didn't mind giving up the dialogue so that they could make it sound fresh. You know, there's a difference between the writer me, who handed over the project to the director me, who then worked with the actors to kind of make things feel 
uh, less stale. Yeah. Fresher. Yeah, because I guess it's that thing that, you know, you can write dialogue that, that sounds great on the page, but then if somebody says it and it doesn't feel natural for them to be saying it, it's going to seem forced and it's going to sound like bad dialogue at that point. It's easier, it makes more sense to let them, you know, tweak it to their own voice. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it, that people always say a lot of the work is done with casting. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the directing, directing is out of the way finished because you've done it in casting. And we had really good casting. Uh, we've got a really good cast. Uh, we've got a cast that, that could spark off each other. And yeah. we've got a cast as well that had very different experiences. You know what I mean? Like um, a very, very sort of improvisational and loose kind of comic style from Mark Devonport. Uh, very kind of television workshop, Nottingham's television workshop, which was famed around the world. Uh, for a few of the actors who who would then form a kind of an ensemble. And then Hal Bennett, who comes from a very different um, stage and screen background, and, and no one wasn't going to ad lib and wasn't going to improvise, except he did improvise, where we did, you know the scene where they're all sat around in the alcohol management centre and they have to draw a picture of the last place they were happy? Yeah. I didn't have to do any work on that day, you know, because Johnny Phillips plays this kind of, this guy that mentors them all, and Hal Bennett drew the wound. <laughs> so, you know what I mean, like they, they, they did all the all the hard work. So it was kind of, that was kind of nice, you know what I mean? And- um, Yeah, that's a fantastic that sort of, job. You know, so yeah. that, because I think that's, that's an early point where you think the film's not, maybe not going in the way that you might, you might expect it to, that these characters, you might expect them all to just be like, taking the piss and very cynical, but they're actually all doing these these weird little kind of heartfelt <laughs> images. I um, think, does it does it work for you, Dave? Because there's, there's that thing where I'm... Um, yeah. Like, there's a kind of, um, like, a, an, an un, unobjectivity thing, like woods, and, woods for the trees kind of thing, yeah. where um, every, every scene in the film... <laughs> I can go through and go, oh, that was the day when this happened, or that was the day where I did, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm learning the job as I'm doing it. So, so I'm never sort of completely clear about what works. So it's really nice to hear that because those scenes were uh, at the beginning of the shoot. Um, all of the scenes that were in the kind of alcohol management centre were kind of at the beginning of the shoot. Right. And we, we had a crew that was kind of, you know, I'd worked with before on one hand, and had come up uh, to help to help support. So we had a really brilliant sound recordist, um, a good sound recording team as well. But uh, we had a really great cinematographer, but we also had a good cinematography team with a second unit and additional cinematography by Stephen Shield and Nick Gordon-Smith as the cinematographer who come up and, um, and try to be as minimalist as he possibly could. He did a lot of Andrew Cotting kind of films and um, you know, I mean, there's kind of an earthiness to his work that I really loved. Mm. But we needed to kind of keep things moving. And for me, it's like I slowed everything down at the, in the first week. I slowed everything down while I tried to, to get my sort of breath and stop panicking and to kind of get things moving along. So everything became very sort of by the script, uh, which is really nice because Johnny Phillips uh, plays this kind of, um, I don't want to call him an asshole. He's a man, he's um, a man with with hidden issues i think yeah you know Maybe he, not so he, hidden. He, he he wants he wants to try out there's a there's an idea that he's constantly doing role playing for them to understand their problems what he really wants to be is the director of some kind of theater group so <laughs> so we had that as a kind of backstory um, which meant that johnny the actor could actually direct it from within so that it slowly started to sort of build shape and um and yeah. make sense and i and i could start to figure it out myself and, and figure out, you know, what my contribution as the director was. So, so you mentioned, um, obviously, Hill Bennett, who I guess is, in, in casting terms, is, is a bit of the odd man out, because, you know, the most famous person who was, was in the film, um, from, like you say, from a very different background. I think, you know, he's, he's no longer with us, is he? So... You know, we can we can probably say, you know, did did he not also famously have a, a bit of an issue with alcohol in real life? 
Um, he did. Um, sort of bless him, really. You know what I mean? Because it, it was it was a very difficult shoot. I think he were, he had. I went to I went to Chelsea to meet him in a in a pub, um, looking over the Thames, and it was very lovely. Um, I got drunk, uh, chatting to him about the role and how I work and uh, what I wanted, you know what I mean? And he, he was really um, won over. It was really nice. Um, but he did tell me that he's on the wagon. And I thought meeting in a pub wasn't the best idea to start <laughs> things off. And he, you know what I mean? So he, he did find it very slippery uh, staying on the wagon or not staying on the wagon. Um, and it made him, I think, feel like he was out of it a little bit more. Um, you know, like less able to kind of take part in kind of any sort of um, stupid banter, you know what I mean, or, or the kind of shenanigans of the rest of the cast and crew. Like he would be quite standoffish, you know what I mean? And um, but that kind I, of works for the character, doesn't it? Well, it worked for the character. Yeah, it, it took me a while to to figure that out. I mean, maybe till I was in the edit suite until I thought, but this is the character. The character is that it stands apart from the rest of them. He thinks they're all foolish. Um, and and how maybe a kind of, although he's not a method actor really, had found a kind of a way to sort of fully embrace that that aspect of the character. And he gave a, a huge amount to us, you know what I mean? He's very sort of um open kind of performance, you know what I mean? An honest kind of performance, like that kind of scene where he gets into the swimming pool and he's very physically there. Um yeah. and, and he, he, there's no vanity in his performance at all, you know what I mean? And I kind of really like that about him. Um, and it's taken me a while to do that, you know what I mean? I found it sometimes very hard to figure out how to direct him. I I kind of, I was kind of quite loose, like, you know what I mean, like I'm saying. Um, but uh, and he, he was quite kind of focused, you know what I mean? And he got into this idea that I was very much a kind of camera kind of director. I knew exactly what to do with the cameras to get the coverage that was needed to give him the space to give you know, as quick a performance as possible. Mm. But in reality, <laughs> it was this kind of, this this hungry for footage kind of person. So I'd shoot him with two cameras, um, which he kind of thought was really clever because it meant it could get a minimum amount of space, a minimum amount of um, of takes. Whereas in reality, it meant that at the, at the beginning that was true, but the moment you start to engage him in conversations with the other actors, they're being shot on two cameras and sometimes they'll warm up by take three or take four, and then he'll start to fade by take four, and then they'll they'll get good by take six. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it's hard to get people up to the same level. Um, but he 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 was you know he went along with kind of a lot of difference. I think going from kind of big budget um, movies, big kind of British TV shows like Shelley, onto something where it was all very kind of handheld and DV and was very Nottingham. Um, you know what I mean? That, that was a big difference culturally for him to kind of uh, step into. And yeah, like you're saying, I mean, it is it is his character. It does work for the character as well. And he was very generous, I think, in, in terms of putting up with me as a kind of novice. And very helpful. He taught me a, a bunch of stuff, really. You know what I mean? It's particularly about, you know, being focused on what those kind of, what the character's goals are. Yeah. He's very good at it. Obviously, you just mentioned... Very good at it. He's a very, very good actor. I, I cast him because I was a huge fan of Twisted Nerve and I was a huge fan of Endless Night. And I loved those kind of really creepy films that I'd glimpsed when I was younger, especially ones where his character always came across as somebody who was really charming and sweet and nice, but also very, very dark and troubled and moody as hell. Uh, and of course, to counter all of that was Shelley, the TV series, which is really brilliant. You know what I mean, it's just you know he's he is epitomizes a kind of generation. Yeah, so, it's kind of funny that Shelley seems to be almost almost like a forgotten show now. I guess it's one of those things like it's an ITV sitcom and they're never as popular, and it just hasn't entered that you know that pantheon of the great sitcoms in the way that you would expect it to because it was hugely popular for a long time, wasn't it? And it talked to people about all kinds of stuff like what a pain in the arse it was trying to get a job. And you know what I mean? I'm, and his sort of anti-establishment kind of tone really spoke to me when I was when I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, and I kept thinking, yeah, you know, Shelley's a really interesting character. Why, why isn't it back on, on TV? 
you know, and, or back out there on on DVD or Blu-ray. And, you know, hopefully it is, and uh, I can get hold of it. It'll no longer be a distant memory. I imagine, I imagine Network have released it. Uh, I hope so. We should check. Yeah, we should check. Well, we'll send everybody them a, watching send this them should a check. Of this and, you know, they can product place and. Uh... <laughs> We'll do a second one episode guide to Shelley. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just talked to her. This week we've watched. Yeah. Because they brought Shelley back, didn't they? Like the, like the Saint. Like the Saint. Roger Moore's the Saint. Got brought back as Ian Ogilvy's the Saint. <laughs> Shelley got brought back, but they kept the actor. That was the big thing they did with Shelley. They moved him from, like, one period of the 80s into another period. I remember, yeah, I remember that there was a point when he divorced his wife or something and then just didn't. Or got married so long ago, I forgot which one of those things. Anyway, there was a wife at one point and not at the other point. You can't remember if that's Shelley or the Lightly Lads. <laughs> well, of course, they brought that back, but did replace the axes. Not successfully. No. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, so... DV this cam, is the stuff maybe, your readers want to hear. DV cam, was it? Like mini DV, I guess. What, what did you shoot on? We shot on uh, Sony 7s? Sony uh, VX2000, VX1000, VX1000. Right. So DV cam and mini DV cam, we'd been kind of really used to for quite some time. Mm. And that, you know, and all those kind of things you, you think about when you think about DV cam now seem so um, old fashioned. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? The, the idea that you could get a camera this big and you could hold it in one hand and there'd be three chips, three chips. Cameras, three chip camera. Well, they were the portraits. You know what I mean? And uh, you could put, pop a little tape in there, you get that little tape out, someone would write up on it and they'd pop it in a box, they'd take it away and they'd digitize it. I mean, that would be amazing how fast that took, rewinding the tape to have a look over. Or was that a good take? Terrifying. But really, not just available, those cameras weren't just available and you'd get your hands on them. But they were all the tools you needed to tell stories, and it meant that you could shoot over and over and over again. You could try out different takes. Yeah. You could get really close to your subject uh, or, or be part of a group of people talking and move around. And it meant to me, uh, by the time we got to One, one for the Road, uh, everyone was kind of, you know, really, really adept uh, with those cameras. Um, and it meant there was a kind of DV culture in Nottingham. And it also meant that I could tell a story in a kind of immersive way without, I know immersive as a word has become a cliche, mm. but that's what I wanted to do with, with One for the Road. That was the kind of mantra for me was to be immersive, to make it, to make it sort of impressionistic. So that if the characters on the screen were drunk, uh, you felt drunk as well. It would kind of wooze around with them and, and try to be as restless as possible. Or if it was kind of angry and agitated, then, you know, the editing would start to sort of be faster and more jagged as things went on. But that was all part, I mean, that was that scene, you know, I think you mentioned in, in the book that we should obviously mention the new, the new Blu-ray on Indicator. And yeah, so you're talking, you're talking in here about the influence of things like, um, like the Dogma 95 movement, which was... Was obviously do it, you know, you weren't working on those rules, but I guess that that influences there showing people how they could go out and, and shoot stuff. Yeah, funnily you enough, know, a, a, friend, of, a friend of, of you know, gatekeeping of, of the mainstream industry. Yeah, a, a friend of mine, just to sort of uh bookend that 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 kind of um that point you're making there about Dogma 95, it'd been a big influence. But a friend of mine, Anya, uh, in Nottingham made a Nottingham-based Dogma 95 film that was officially a Dogma 95 film. Right. And she did this film by getting loads of camera operators to be in different parts of the cooperative theatre um, and pick up a story as it went around, like this kind of ad-libbed, improvised story moving up and down through the theatre. I think it, it kind of became an unfinished project, but for a while it was an official Dogma 95 film. Um, but that, and that was after after One for the Road. But um, with One for the Road, we had rules, but we didn't have the sort of dogmatic Dogma 95 rules. Yeah. Um, we had been influenced by them because 
one of the things they were trying to do was to get away from being constrained by aesthetic um, or a kind of uh, a glossy overproduced kind of look had started to emerge in Danish cinema maybe um, mm -hmm. but certainly in low budget filmmaking where everyone was aiming for something more than the story more than the heart of what the film was supposed to be about yeah and dogma mm -hmm. made things much looser and much more focused on telling a story um, so they'd been like Feston for example had been a big influence on everybody because you'd be figuring out how do you do it but also you became aware through something like Feston the film was really, really grainy and grey and washed out and had contrast issues. But you didn't care because the story was compelling, the characters were really believable and you wanted to kind of find out what was going to happen next. And you know what I mean? And you were swept up in the storytelling. Um, so it was, it was that, that thing that really, really got on my nerves all the time was this kind of need for things to look like a proper film. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, I really fucking hated that kind of that's that sort of ambition at the beginning. But you know what I mean? Like before you can tell a story, uh, make it look like a proper film. Hey, so and so's looks like a proper film because he shot it on 16 mil or 35 mil, or he's put a film effect on it, or it's um you know what I mean? Like film yeah. effect is like a big deal. And but it's to me it's kept, kept getting in the way of the tool, like made, made everything about the tools of telling the story, the camera rather than what was on screen. But it's that cultural snobbery as well, isn't it? That is why people criticise, you know, low budget movies in general or, you know, horror films. You know, if you look at some of those 60s, 70s films that essentially threw out the rules of filmmaking, maybe not by choice, but just by accident because those guys didn't know how to make films. They just went out yeah. and made one anyway. And you, you know, that's what I've always been saying. That stuff's not bad. It's just different. It's just because it doesn't look like everything else. You think it's terrible for some reason. Well, this is one of the things that that that, I, that I'm talking about. I think really in the in the booklet, you know, from old interviews and from new, um, and from the commentaries and the rest of it that come with the Blu-ray, is it's two things. One of them is the culture um, that was emerging in Nottingham and the East Midlands filmmaking scene at that time. Uh, had had been since the late 90s and the other the other thing was kind of the immediacy like we had like a 16 mil camera but they got rid of it so no one could hire it so there wasn't anyone going to make anything on film so everybody was making stuff on tape and some people were more um honest about tape than others do you know what i mean and uh, you just get stuck in and use it to tell story and to make things um pure and not to worry about you know what things might might feel like and to use what those things might feel like productively, intelligently, feeding it into the storytelling as well. But then the other side of that is that there was essentially a digital revolution. I remember going up um, to Edinburgh and Sight and Sound had invited me to be part of a panel discussion for an article they were writing on the digital deluge. And my, my argument was that the digital deluge meant essentially that everyone in, in, in Britain could make a film. Um, who would want to see them though? Someone asked in the room. And I kept thinking, this is the problem is that those people that have spent thousands on their education, you know, at film school would have to sort of give way to people that had never been to film school um, and weren't interested. And, and unfortunately what happened was that that digital technology that for so long was here and small and available and handheld started to get bigger and bigger and bigger and get 30, 30 different lenses and become really complicated. And, and that complication meant that it was uh, taken back by gatekeepers. Yeah. Um, and people that would control what kind of stories people wanted to tell. But in reality, this happened, didn't it? Things like this, where our phones got really good cameras and people like Sean Baker would, would make um, things like Tangerine. Uh, and you kind of think, Again, there's this kind of wanting things to have an immediacy, you know, wanting things to be on the fly and and shot quickly. Uh, but you could also, with with phones or with really cheap TV cam cameras, you can tell genre stories and thrillers and romances and whatever you want to use. It's just the tools. It's still a camera. It's still a lens that sees things. Yeah. I mean, I guess, like, 
found footage is a great example of that, isn't it? That whole idea of, you know, using that, that. using that equipment to tell a new kind of story. Well, maybe the whole sort of uh, story of found footage, uh, or even those kind of not even lost, but um, mimicking mm. other formats, uh, demonstrates how important just the story is, like Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah. I mean, that's a mixture of found footage and not found footage. But um, it's found footage is assembled to show you how um, meaning is manufactured. You know, let's put let's put a score over it. Let's let's alter its meaning. Yeah. Um, and then right through to Blair Witch, where there is a kind of a relationship between how that film's been made and how the audience interprets it and feel it has really become sophisticated, both on screen and online. Um, that's really. But then that found footage thing phenomena post Blair Witch led to all kinds of um, other productions as well that weren't found footage, but were playful about the formatting. Things like Series 7, The Contenders, where you suddenly thought, oh, this is like TV fo format. It's, it's, it's all very video and it's all kind of, um, you know, through a TV lens that things are being understood, which is a very Nigel Neal kind of thing to do. I can't remember what the question was. Did you have a question in there, David? I don't. I don't think so. Other than just, <laughs> we were just talking. You know, just I was just thinking about you know how something like found footage comes along and becomes a genre that. Okay, so you've got kind of a Holocaust. You've got a couple of other examples you might flip back to, but essentially couldn't really exist until there was that point where you could have people going out with small cameras and have and build a narrative about people going out with small cameras doing stuff. You know, because previously nobody would lug in a 60 millimeter camera around the streets maybe maybe well, there's that thing isn't it that when we were getting trained we uh had to use with i, I was on a, a scheme called head start that was for uh you had to be unemployed and be unemployed for a certain period of time to apply to get on it and then it was whittled down to 10 people and then you would sign off you get you get your housing benefit paid and, right. and you would learn how to do all these different roles in a film. And we, when we started out, we'd, we'd start out with things like Umatic, where you'd have the recording part of the camera over one shoulder, and then the camera over the other one, and this hugely heavy kind of equipment. But you'd learn, you'd learn how to structure things. And maybe what you're talking about is kind of the fact that there's still an unexplored and potentially hidden uh, narrative around film and British film um, that doesn't get explored so much, which is things like community project, um, yeah, yeah. films that are made about uh, issues that are nearer to home, um, films that are, are shot on video because that's the shortest route to meeting the, the, the audience that need to see, need to be galvanised, need to be part of the story themselves. Um, do you know what I mean? And, and, and then it, even within that, there are kind of... We, we did a short film festival called Bang, um, with Donna and Adam Bowyer. And um, Bang would put on a lot of films that have been generated by a lot of filmmakers who um, just wanted to reach like-minded people. Like, and, and I quickly kind of learned that short filmmaking isn't necessarily a route to feature filmmaking. It's, it's a route to more short filmmaking. Yeah. And, you know, and building audiences and getting responses from audiences. So I think there's like a kind of, a slightly hidden history of British film um, that isn't mainstream and isn't um, about cinema. But it's, it's, a, it's a thought that I had when I, when I was watching One for the Road and thinking, well, here's something that obviously looks, you know, remo you know technically looks removed from what we would see of being a, a kind of a mainstream film of 2003 because you know you've shot it on on dv and even with the best dv cams there was you know there's a there's a visual limitation that doesn't clearly isn't going to match 35 millimeter but now it feels like everything's kind of converged you know we've got you know 4k cameras that people can use domestically that yeah they don't look that different from you know, they're perfectly fine to show in a cinema. 
Yeah, they don't, they don't look a lot different from what you would see on TV, and what you see on TV doesn't look that different from what you will see on on the big screen. That that whole separation between those things seems to have gone to a large degree now. So I'm just wondering if, you know, is that the way you thought things would go, and and is that the thing the way you thought things should go that everything would end up being the same? I think um, oh, it's a really interesting thought in there about uh, aesthetics and how to find a kind of route through the material. I mean, maybe I, I come from like a fine art background, although I haven't been there in that background for decades. But um, there was always this idea, you know what I mean? You canvas and paper and, and sculpting and building, yeah. uh, mark making mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. Um, I kind of think that there is a thing about the the story of of the kit. When we when we were shooting um, one for the road, we had, we had quite a practiced kind of idea around things like how much gain you could turn up before the 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 blacks would break up and become very grainy. Yeah, but I kind of quite like it. So there's like a limit, you know. So you go this far, and then everything gets crunchy, and that's where we leave it. We don't have to go over the top. Nowadays, the kind of patina, the kind of surface effect of all of those films can get glossier and glossier. Mm. Um, but the glossiness isn't the important thing. It's the kind of the materiality of something like, uh, what does it feel like? What yeah. can I do yeah. with it? Um, what If I do this to it, how, do, how does it get interpreted? Sometimes in a really sort of easy way, like um, like direct influences, um, like there's a scene where they're sat around the fireplace and getting drunk and the camera sort of goes all woozy and I, and I just ripped off every shot from Stone, the Australian biker movie, uh, where they get stoned. Well, and, uh, but, you're going to rip, rip off the best. But it was, it was kind of easy to do because it just meant, you know, moving the lens in front of the camera. Uh, so it was fun. Um, but it's an effect, it's an effect, you know what I mean? It's a direct effect that you're after. Whereas what I kind of liked was when the picture looked grainy and noisy and was full of gain, that the audience would be, be sort of made, made sort of unconsciously uncomfortable by it, you know what I mean, by the lack of glass. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a scene um, that's shot on night vision um, and there's a lot of dropout because of the, the camera cable would, would, that went to the kind of infrared mm. would, um, would kind of wobble slightly and it would do this digital dropout. I thought digital dropout's great because it felt to me like it was a psychological kind of thing where you, the audience can see how the character feels because of digital dropout. It's kind yeah. of film as some sort of seance as opposed to some more logical kind of thing. And now that everything's the same, to answer your question, now that everything's the same and you can shoot 4K on your camera and you can shoot shoot 4K or, or watch 4K uh, theatrically um, with, with your Batman or whatever, um, which is really cool. Uh, it's just a tool. It's just a tool. But what that tool gives you um, should mean something, should have some impact on, on the storytelling. Yeah, because I think what what concerns me, I suppose, is this is the thought that all this democratization of technical equipment seems to have actually, as you were talking about earlier a little bit, you know, played it played more into the hands of gatekeepers, and that somehow it's not made it easier for people to go out and make their own alternative films. It's possibly made it harder. Um, yeah, equipment equipment has become. Maybe not make them, but you know, but but then, you know, have them seen. Have the. It's almost like, you know, there's nothing to make. You know, do you think that something like One for the Road, for instance, you know, if you made that now and you made that on 4K, would that have the same, the same connection? If I made, because it, it would it would essentially still look like everything else then, wouldn't it? Yeah, but I, I I think it's how you want to tell the story. I mean, like I, I knew with One for the Road that I wanted to tell the story immersively and that it would be impressionistic, um, you know, like portraits and they would be the characters' feelings would impact on the on the film. I'd made these two shorts before, Shifting Units, and before that a film called Map of the Scars and uh, edited them with my friend Annie Watson 
and she um, is a great yeah, editor. We're on here, aren't they? They're, oh, they're also available, yeah, on here uh, in the extras. Yeah, in the extensive extras. Um, so they're there, there, right? Those, those two of, shorts. I'll, I'll cut in a little close up for people to see exactly what's on this incredible disc. What we kind of, what we kind of, what, thank you. What we kind of wanted to do was to let the character psychological state impact on the audience by impacting on the editing. So if they were blurry, it was blurry. If they weren't, if they were losing uh, the kind of, uh, any kind of narrative continuity in their, um, in their voiceover, then, you know what I mean, we would lose it as well. Do you know what I mean? And the edit would kind of follow the emotional kind of state of the character and mirror it. Uh, so we did that with Map of the Scars and we kind of refined it into a kind of less um, sort of fine art kind of approach for shifting units, where it was much more kind of character-based um, storytelling anyway. Yeah. Um, but we still had this kind of idea of, of wooziness and people losing time and all the things that you can do with editing um, we, we, we played around with. Um, so they informed the kind of way that we told the story. So if I was going to make something on, on 4K or if I was going to shoot, use it, I'd be shooting using a camera. I'd make one for the room with a bunch of these. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and impossibly instead of using the direct to camera kind of narration that the characters um, provide at the beginning of thing where, it, you know, where we introduce the kind of ensemble, I'd probably allow them to talk directly uh, to their cameras um, because people have got, people have got, um, phones with them all the time you know i mean they're like an extra filming part of our psychology time, people, mm -hmm. are, people are filming selfies all the time now it's, it's not it's not even on you i mean you probably have to shoot it like portrait from that though um i think i would i mean i think that there's something to be said for it isn't there that um like you know people always say oh i've, I've had these conversations I, I teach film and um People have these, these conversations about what's the right format. Mm. And I was going to think, well, there's the right format for the job. And that's the one that's the right format for telling the story or, you know, or, or engaging the audience in, in understanding the story. But, um, you know, if you suggest this kind of vertical framing, people go, oh, no, but that's, that's paintings, that's portraiture. We come from a whole tradition of understanding character through portrait. And, and, you know, and the characters placed in landscape. So I kind of think, uh, yeah, if I did one for the road now, it would be shot on iPhones and um, it would be in vertical <laughs> portrait, portrait mode. Because that's, that's how people react. Like, like that shot that people get, that selfie, that's, yeah. ki that's kind of like that because we're like that. We're, yeah. we're, we're vertical. Yeah, it actually... It weirdly makes more sense in terms of how we think than than this kind of shot, doesn't it? But but what, what what I guess once we get this kind of vertical horizontal plane, we start thinking about eye lines, yeah, looking across the space, and and how we can create this otherwise empty space, give it meaning, um, both geographical kind of meaning that links two characters together, or yeah, uh, narrative you thematic also, yeah like with your playboy with my play, with my tash and playboy collection yeah worth pointing that, it out that does that does it does stand out quite heavily on the shelf it's got to be said it looks like you're sponsored your shelf is sponsored by playboy oh uh, well i i wish believe me <laughs> it could also be sponsored by the new yorker that's also quite a big chunky collection but of course, you know, they look like books and that is five books in that box, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. So let's, let's, I'm kind of intrigued, kind of watching one for the road. Obviously, I've, I've known you a long time, so I, you know, I think people might watch that and think that you have, um, you know, a particular issue. Well, they won't now, obviously, an issue with, uh, with alcohol and pubs. Clearly you've got nothing against alcohol or pubs. <laughs> well, I was trying not to be, um, not to moralistic. be moralistic. Yeah. Um, 
I just kind of I'm just interested in the characters. You know what I mean? Like what yeah. what what was it like to be them? Uh, what were they thinking? What were their problems? What did they think were solutions to their problems that actually complicated their problems even more? You know, and just their failure to get what they kind of want uh, struck me as being really interesting. You know what I mean? Like 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 winding them up, I guess, really. But um, or the way that they would wind each other up. So rather than it be like a sort of moralizing thing about them and alcohol, um, I wanted it to be about how these men, when they were together, they found themselves at the brink or at the edge of the of a kind of void that they could fall into. The, one of the others would reach out and push them in. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? And the, there, there was no real concrete friendship. You know what I mean? And um, everybody wanted something. I think I'm, it's much more cynical. It's much more like a like a, a kind of portrait of people who will step on each other to get what they want. Yeah, I mean, you know, not not to be not to be too kind of spoilerific or anything for people that have not seen the film, but yeah, there's there's one particular character who's <laughs> just like the, just the most unple- unpleasant individual. I won't I won't say what a mutual friend of ours referenced him as, but. But you know, you do use that word quite a lot in the film as well. And <laughs> yeah. hence the 18 certificate. Yeah. Yeah. You, that's very impressive that you still got an 18 after all these years. After all these years, yeah. It's it kind of you'd have thought the effing and blinding would still have an impact on the 18 certificate. But yeah. I think uh I well, we I know that nobody hard. under 18, you know, uses those words. Yeah, I mean, well, they don't know them, and that's the that's so. Do show them eighteen certificate films so they can learn some swears. But it's that thing as well, isn't it? Where um, I kind of wanted to, I wanted to get an eighteen certificate, uh, which is probably the last thing that the funders would want to hear. You know what I mean? That they want to restrict the size of the potential audience. Um, although you get those, if you're okay now, <laughs> you get those reviews that would say the full Monty meets the office. And you kind of think, yeah, they're both 15 certificates. So, you know, we're not going to get that audience. I've got to say, you know, I, I, I didn't really get that from the film. No, it's very bleak. Um, <laughs> there's no, there's no <laughs> stripping. It's very bleak. I kind of, I mean, I think that's, that's me, though. I think I'm very bleak. And um, I kind of, like, my portraits of people that, you know, I kind of, revealing people is kind of really de- desperate and um, their, their vision, their thinking is kind of clouded, their judgment clouded by, by booze. Uh, and they would be clouded by anything else. Do you know what I mean? That's what I mean by saying I'm not moralizing. I think I'd be, I, their, view, their view of things would be clouded by their own ambition. But isn't, isn't that kind of life though, unless, you know, that we all, you know, most of us just scramble through life trying to figure out how just to get from one point to another. And if we've got grand plans, those grand plans never really work out. And, you know, so, you know, <laughs> life is not, it's not easy for most people. It's just, it's a constant thing of going from one difficulty to another. Absolutely. Just when you think you're out of the problems, new problems arise. Yeah. Um, and I kind of think that's, I mean, that's why one for the road has got a very sort of cyclical and, um, and small plot it's got a very small story yeah but it doesn't i mean it's interesting that it you know it doesn't offer any easy answers it doesn't it doesn't offer any kind of really happy endings it's just you know it happens and you know in the way that life happens the good stuff happens well, that was the idea come along to fuck it up <laughs> imagine out imagine uh, typing it all up over the summer on your own all the execs have gone on long holidays the south of France, and you're just typing away, going, "Jesus, this is bleak." <laughs> <laughs> but, but because you're on your own, you think this is bleaker than I thought. <laughs> I'm making it bleaker, <laughs> like um, swimming pools, and you know, seen as really kind of glamorous kind of things to have. Um, you know, a really kind of like chintzy and kitsch. Uh, things to have you know what I mean and you just kind of uh, it's not a thing about taste but it is a thing about mm. the kind of pointless the meaninglessness 
of the, of the kind of material sort of um, materialism. <laughs> it's a really anti-capitalist thing. People are being driven insane for the, by their own drive to make it out of there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so thing. bleak. This is going to put people off watching it. It's so bleak. No, but it's fun though as well. It's you know, it's genuinely you know very funny and. Um, but you know it's realistic, and it's not. You know it's not that kind of. It does. It doesn't feel. I mean, it, in the one. Yeah, let me rephrase that because I think on the one hand it does feel very much like that kind of, you know, British realism, and on the other hand it feels quite removed from that whole that whole area. I think sometimes, uh, yeah. I mean, we, we were talking about this beforehand, like the, like the, it's the not adventures. Popular. Well, the adventures movies got released by Indicator. At the same the same day and date as one for the road was released and yeah, yeah. the adventures films and the confessions films to an extent as well um had been a big a big influence uh on one for the road in terms of its sort of um in terms of its bleakness because if you watch an adventures movie and they had to do an establishing shot that was a pure portrait of what the time and place was like a kind of you know a mundane british street you know it's overcast there's no gloss to the shot no one's wet the pavements down or put any lights up. The extras haven't been art directed. They're not even extras. They're just people walking through the frame. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's something so sort of grottily naturalistic that it resonates and you recognise it as a truthful portrait of the places that you've lived or visited. In, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they're really authentic. And I kind of wanted to do something like that with One for the Road. And I, I, I got particularly kind of obsessed with a film called uh, The Best Pair of Legs in the Business. Because I kept thinking that it's a portrait of utter despair, yeah, of someone who's desperately trying to make you laugh, and I kept thinking his reaction to being betrayed is to try to try to make things work even more. It's just a horrible thing. Of watching yeah, you know, when you when you mentioned that, I mean, you know, God knows how many people watching this will will even know that movie, but it is a yeah, fantastically bleak film with Reg Varney. Who you kind of think of as you know just a bloke from on the buses, but in that he's just you know so pathetic and downtrodden, and yeah, definitely trying to make it. And I can I can see that in those characters like Paul. I can see that kind of thing of you know constantly denying the reality of their own terrible existences, and well, then putting on the people when when that reality hits them. I like the I like the idea of characters. You know, I mean, it's kind of. Maybe it's me, it's my taste. But like the spaghetti westerns that I like are the ones that are the most cynical, hard-edged and bleak. You know what I mean? Those kind of 70s thrillers that I like are the ones that have the really dour endings that things yeah. aren't resolved on. So there was a whole period of like American cinema and international cinema, really, uh, in the 60s and 70s, where there was the sort of um, a nihilism uh, to a lot of the storytelling, a lot of political kind of nihilism in spaghetti westerns. Mm. They they'd been an influence. The the things that have influenced One for the Road have been really really odd, like um, Three Businessmen by Alex Cox, because he'd borrowed from uh, Bunuel. Yeah. Um, so what I'd borrowed from Bunuel. So I thought I'll have a bit of exterminating angel in there, and then then I've got stuff like um, Sh uh, Shogun Assassin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just because I want somebody to talk about. Um, samurai, the way of the samurai, and then you kind of keep, keep going through it, going. I, I've put in references to that day at the Aussie biker movie Stone, mm. um, alongside kind of some, some practical solutions, practical solutions like where you'll go, how do I film a car at night driving down a road? Um, oh, like the like the shots in Orfe by Cocteau. <laughs> I just think I can't believe. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to make a sort of low-budget British improvisational black comedy, but I'm also pretentious enough to go. I'll borrow a shot from Cocteau's Orfe. Yeah, but isn't that isn't that the classic thing that you're going to take? You know, if you're going to take stuff, you're going to take it from the stuff that you love and that is the best. <laughs> you well, know, you're going to say, "Oh, that, that, that film had that film looked really shit. I'll copy that." I think that's 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 true, isn't it? And I, I just saw an interview. Uh, about um, the influence of Conan on the Norsemen. Right. Uh, and uh, Eggers there was talking about how everything, everything is probably borrowed from Conan because he's seen Conan so many times. You know what I mean? And you can't make a film that's, that's set with that kind of sword and sorcery kind of narrative without referencing Conan. 
yeah and i guess that's that point that if you've seen stuff and you love stuff and you've grown up with it it's all there it's, it's all there in your head isn't it whether you like if it you're a, if you're a film fan that's your film school isn't it is going to the cinema and saying so this is this is a wide shot and these are medium shots and these are reversals and you can construct a narrative using these kind of things, but you can also see how they uh, got around or how cameras move or what's a good shot. You know, I mean, why, why do you think it's a good shot? Just by watching loads of films. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're in this kind of really media rich. Uh, I mean, look, I've got too many films just here anyway. Um, and we all have, haven't we? we be, we've become kind of collectors, but at the same time, we're in a media-rich age of being able to watch good film and good TV and classic film and classic TV. Um, getting people aware of it sometimes is is really difficult, but it's a really positive kind of thing that we do have a kind of media-rich oh, culture. Oh, if you want it. Yeah, it should be somewhere. Yeah. And if you find something that's truly rare, get in touch with Indicator. <laughs> but yeah, so you would... I mean, you talked a little bit about the whole the whole Nottingham thing. I mean, I remember. I mean, I guess this was probably already underway when I when I got to Nottingham, and I was totally unaware of it for for several years. But yeah, there's that whole that whole kind of Nottingham film scene, um, which you know is covered again. You know, one of the one of the major extras on here is, is uh, Charles Newland's documentary about the making of the yeah. film, which is also, I guess, about the Nottingham, the Nottingham film scene of the early 2000s. So well, this is, this is beyond, beyond the film. I mean, if, if the Blu-ray's got any kind of uh, additional value, I mean, or, or value at all, it's, it's about um, the Nottingham film scene. It's about a kind of culture in the East Midlands um, that grew out of, out of, like, out, out of the availability of certain types of equipment um and the availability of time a lot of the time for people who are unemployed to yeah, be this, able this to... course sounds fantastic it sounds like you know all the, all the kind of courses i went on except getting you to do something interesting rather than just you know start a business that was clearly never going to succeed well we had we, we, we had a brilliant tutor and a guy called roger not fail um even his surname told you that you weren't going to fail <laughs> um, he was amazing, and, uh, and and there were really great film filmmakers like uh, like Donna Bowyer and uh, John Ross, who made the kind of um, John Cooper Clark documentary mm. uh, for the BBC, and Stephen Shield, who did Mum and Dad, the kind of the the ultimate sleazy British horror film. <laughs> of its <laughs> um, so so you know what I mean. So we were all on that kind of course, and year in year out, there were really brilliant new filmmakers going through. Um, going through training um, and it was really equipping people to actually be able to work independently um, and it's kind of weird that those things don't exist so much anymore what yeah. does exist though I still think does exist is a kind of filmmaking culture um, I think there are still networking opportunities in Nottingham and there are kind of ways for people therefore to be able to collaborate and to make things and shooters in the pub and all those kind of um, schemes and opportunities that are still around um, but what's missing, I think, is the idea that with cheap equipment comes the idea that you can learn the ropes by just working on everybody's film. My my background, like I'm saying, like I, I learned how to paint and stuff in Stoke-on-Trent. Uh, and then when I finished my degree, I had nothing because I, I learned how to be a fine artist. So I had no job. And a mate of mine who was in a band that I managed was going down to Nottingham uh, to do, do his degree there because I had a film course. And I thought, a film course? I wish I'd done film. So I followed, followed him down to because I figured figuring out if I'm going to sign on in Stoke, I may as well sign on in Nottingham. It's as good a place to be unemployed as anywhere. Yeah. So I could, yeah. I, so I could shadow him and hang out with him while he was on his degree. And then, you know, some of the other, I'd, so I'd shoot his, uh, his shorts while he was doing his short filmmaking. Uh, I'd be his, his photographer. And then other people would come, come along and say, well, I like the photography you did on that. Can you shoot my short film for me? And you think, yeah, I'll do that one. Because people thought I was a student. <laughs> and then after a while, I got older and some of the students thought I was a tutor. But um, <laughs> I've been working on it for too long, you know what I mean? But with the support of people like Paul Huff, who uh, is still really important in, in Nottingham, and, uh, you know, there was this kind of stuff like Polycine, setting up a kind of film society 
uh, <laughs> that would screen kind of classic um, examples of cinema. Um, so that people were constantly just immersed in the kind of culture of making things. And when you weren't doing stuff five days a week um, on student projects, then you had the weekends where you could get camera equipment and make, make more films. Yeah. And yeah. then when, when I was unemployed for five years, I could get onto that scheme, um, Head Start, and then I could learn how to do things that I hadn't been able to learn how to do while pretending to be a student because, you know, I, I wasn't going to be allowed into the edit suites, for example. Um, you know what I mean? And I could really kind of find out how to do those things. And I think there's, there's, there's a culture that was where people would say stuff like, I'm going to shoot a horror movie at the weekend. What are you doing? And you think, I'll, I'm making a horror film with you at the weekend then. And you just wanted to do it. You just wanted to be part of that stuff. And, they, and if you wanted to learn about tight storytelling, you'd try and work on like Steve Shields films, you know what I mean? Because he was, he had this kind of, this conceptual approach to filmmaking that was all there, you know what I mean? And it was kind of really tight and effective. Or um, if you wanted to learn about uh, editing being this kind of way of, of writing a film, you, you'd look at Simon Ellis's short films, you know what I mean? Because he was so inventive, um, so clever. He had these kind of ideas and only he knew how to pull them off. And it was amazing kind of visual filmmaking. So there were all these filmmakers um, like emerging from that kind of culture, like like Jeannie Finley and people like that, you know what I mean? People that were just had stories to tell yeah. and, and ways to tell them. I can't remember what the question was. That's fine. We were talking, just talking about the, the emerging Nottingham film scene of the early 2000s. But this is this is probably a good point to uh, to stop the first part of this interview. And we'll come back and, and talk about mayhem and and things like that in a in a. I'll get, I'll get another beer then. A short while. We'll get another beer, but in the meantime, um, as I'll probably cut this off at this point for the first half of this. Quick reminder again, everybody: one for the road, out on indicator, huge amount of extras, um, double sleeve, complete with the. Um, let's take the disc out. There you go with the uh, the original. Graham Humphreys design, I believe, is that for yeah, it's a Graham Humphreys design DVD. Yeah, that was done for the DVD that Tartan released in two thousand and five. Uh, and Graham Humphreys is kind of really famous, isn't he, for doing things like the Evil Dead Two posters, for example, really iconic kind of posters um, for Palace and uh, and for Tartan as well. But um, absolutely, that one, which is much more kind of photo realist, kind of yeah. So everybody can buy that and we'll we'll get another drink and we'll discuss all the other stuff in a minute. See you on the other side. I'm just I'm wanting to say something clever. See you on the other side. Yeah. See you on the other side of another beer. I'm gonna go and open a beer. Me too. <clears throat> so thanks again to Chris for that. As we said at the beginning, if you want to see more, you can check it out on our patreon and buy me a coffee pages where you'll be able to access another 25 or so minutes of chris's words of wisdom discussing the mayhem film festival and other things like that so feel free to join us there and until then we'll see you soon